Today we're going to look at an interesting result that I found in the math magazine and it has to do with triangular numbers and square numbers. But let's recall what a triangular number is first. So the nth triangular number, which we'll denote by t sub n, is simply the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n. And you might say, well, why is that a triangular number? Well, that's because any number like this can be represented by a triangle of dots. So let's observe that, for instance, this number right here is the representation of the third triangular number. And in fact, well, what is it? It's 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is kind of obviously equal to 6. Now, let's also observe that there's this closed form that I wrote on the board for the nth triangular number of n times n plus 1 over 2, and this is well known. We've actually proved that on the channel many times, and we won't do that today. Now, I'd like to observe that if we add the n minus first triangular number with the nth triangular number, we simply get the nth squared number, in other words, n squared. And you can see that algebraically simply by adding this object with a similar object for n minus 1, or you could in fact see it geometrically as taking this triangle and completing it into a square by adding in, well, some sort of triangle associated to the previous triangular number. I'll let you guys think about that as well. And then a classic result that often you see in an elementary number theory class is when is a triangular number also a square number, which ends up being finding a solution to the equation t sub n equals m squared. In other words, n times n plus 1 over 2 equals m squared. We're not going to go through that here, but if you'd like to see a video on that, maybe post it in the comments. It has to do with solutions to a so-called Pell's equation, and you end up with the following parameterization of values of n. There's a similar parameterization of values of m as well. Notice that we've got this crazy thing of 3 plus 2 times the square root of 2 to the k power plus, well, 3 minus 2 times the square root of 2 to the k power. That should be to the k power all over 4. And then from that, we're going to subtract a half. And that's the values of n that give us a perfect square triangular number. And I think maybe one thing that's pretty interesting about this is it's not super obvious that this even gives us a rational number, let alone a positive integer, but it in fact does. Okay, cool. So now I'd like to point out that our main goal here is kind of motivated by this. This is when the sum of a single triangular number is a square number. This is the sum of two consecutive triangular numbers is a square number. And here we're going to look at when is the sum of three consecutive triangular numbers a square number. Now let's observe that my square number over there looks a little bit different and that's because the square number will be bigger than n squared. So that means we can write it as n plus a squared where a is, well, it's got to be bigger than or equal to 1, right? So now let's see what this boils down to. So by this over here, we know tn minus 1 plus tn is simply n squared. So we might as well take advantage of that to simplify this. So this immediately gives us n squared. And then this next term will give us n plus 1 times n plus 2 all over 2. And, well, that's because we can use this right here where we substitute n plus 1 for n. And then over here we'll have n plus a quantity squared. So now let's observe that we can multiply both sides of this equation by 2 and then we can also expand everything out and we'll be left with 2n squared plus n squared plus 3n plus 2 equals 2n squared plus 4 times a times n plus 2a squared. So again, that's by multiplying by 2 to get rid of that denominator and then moving, well, actually, we didn't move, move anything around, but just combining things as needed. Okay, but now we can move stuff around like I just alluded to, and that's going to give us the following quadratic equation in the variable n. So we have n squared and then minus 4a minus 3 times n, 
and then minus two times a squared minus one equals zero. So there's our quadratic equation where we think of n as the variable and a is maybe like a parameter or something. Now the first thing that we're going to do is maybe observe that there are some kind of obvious small solutions. And those small solutions are when n and a are either equal to 0 and 1 or they're equal to 1 and 1. Now notice that the 0 and 1 case for a will give us what? It'll give us t sub minus 1 plus t sub 0 plus t sub 1. But notice that we don't really know what t sub minus 1 is geometrically, but we can definitely plug it in here and we see that we get zero. So that's how we will interpret that t sub minus 1. So just to maybe see that explicitly, this corresponds to 0 plus 0 plus 1 equals 1 squared. So that's the minus first triangular number plus the zeroth triangular number plus the first triangular number equals the first square number. And then this second one corresponds to 0 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 equals 2 squared. So that's the zeroth triangular number plus the first triangular number plus the second triangular number equals the second square number. And then the next thing that we want to do is, you know, present a function that will allow us to take a solution and create a new solution. And so let's look at that function. It'll in fact be something called an affine function. And what it'll do is it'll take n comma a and we'll say it send, sends it to f of n comma a, and it's defined like this. So we've got 9a, so we have 9n plus 4a plus 2 comma, let's see, 2n plus a plus 1. So that's what our function does, that's our affine transformation. And let's observe that we can write this in matrix vector form if we'd like to as the matrix 9, 4, and then let's see, 2, 1, multiplying into the vector n, a, and then we add the vector 2, 1. But now let's observe that we can put this completely into matrix vector form like this. So we've got f evaluated at v, or maybe we'll write it like this. We'll say the vector w equals f evaluated at the vector v, which is this matrix 9, 4, 2, 1, multiplying into the vector v plus the vector 2, 1. But now let's observe that we can solve this for the vector v pretty easily. And we'll get our vector v is simply equal to the inverse of the matrix 9, 4, 2, 1 times the vector w, and then let's see, minus the vector 2, 1. But then the inverse of that matrix is actually pretty straightforward. Notice that the determinant is 1 because we have 9 times 1 minus 4 times 2. And then, well, after we know the determinant is 1, we find the inverse of this matrix by swapping the diagonals and negating the off diagonals. So that's going to end up leaving us with 1, 9 on the diagonals, and then we have minus 4, minus 2 on the off diagonals, times our vector w, and then we're going to subtract, or we'll turn it into addition, the inverse of this matrix multiplying into 2, 1. But that's, in fact, going to give us the same thing as adding the vector 2, minus 5. Okay, and now, now we can interpret this, like I just said before, as the inverse of our function f. So we can think about this thing right here as f inverse evaluated at w. But now if we were to put this back in terms of our like component-wise definition, like we have for our original definition of f right here, we would have something like this. So f inverse 
of n comma a ends up being the following. So it's going to be n minus 4a plus 2. And then after that, it's going to be minus 2n plus 9a minus 5. So that's our inverse of our function f. Okay, well, I haven't really said what this function f does, or in fact, what its inverse does. So let's see what this is all about. So on the last board, we talked about some very small solutions to our problem of n0, a1, and n1 and a1. And then we introduced two affine transformations. We called them f and then f inverse. Well, they were inverses of each other. And they were defined as follows. Or maybe we defined f and then we constructed f inverse. And now here's a really important claim. And that is if n comma a is a solution to that quadratic equation. But let's recall if it's a solution to that quadratic equation, then it's a solution to this three triangle one square solution. Okay, so if it's a solution to our big goal, then so is f evaluated at n comma a. And then kind of obviously, or in parallel to that, so is f inverse applied to n comma a. Now, the proof of this is simply a calculation. So let's maybe set capital N, capital A, equal to f of little n, little a. Let's recall that that is 9n plus 4a plus 2, and then 2n plus a plus 1. Okay, now, well, now what we want to do is consider maybe the capital letters plugged into our would-be quadratic equation. So we've got capital N squared minus 4 capital A minus 3 times N, and then minus 2 capital A squared minus 1. And now this is, like I said before, simply kind of a big calculation. So I probably won't do all of the details, but it ends up being something like this. So we have 9n plus 4a plus 2 quantity squared minus, so 4a minus 3. Let's see if we can do that kind of all at once. So that's going to end up being 4n and then, let's see, plus 4a. And then we've got 4 times 1 minus 3, so plus 1. And then that's multiplied into capital N which is 9n plus 4a, and then plus 2. And then from that, we need to subtract this 2 times a squared minus 1. So that's going to be minus 2 times 2n plus a plus 1 quantity squared. And like I said, at this point, it's just kind of a big calculation. So perhaps I won't do all of the details. But what we end up seeing is that this is equal to zero. But what that tells us is that capital N comma A is a solution to our three triangles, one square problem. In other words, T of capital N minus one plus T of capital N plus T of capital N plus one is equal to capital N plus A quantity squared. Okay, great. But now we can use this to form an infinite list of solutions to our equation. And that's simply by applying our function to those two seeds over and over and over again. So let's get some of those numbers on the board and then we'll prove our main result. And that is that every such solution to our equation up here is on that list. Okay, so as promised, here's a list of solutions that we can build using this previous result and our seeds. And now this list of solutions is most definitely like uh, pretty interesting, but the main interesting thing about this list of solutions is in fact all solutions to our equation are on one of these two lists. So let's maybe write that out in a theorem. So every solution to, I'll just put star here, and then maybe I'll label this equation star. So two equation star is of the form, 
let's maybe write it like this. F sub k evaluated at v with uh, v coming from the set of the seeds. So we've got 0, 1, or 1, 1. And then I guess I should say what f sub k is, and that is simply the k-fold composition of f. So that's going to be f sub k is equal to f composed with f composed all the way up, composed with F. And well, I won't write this out. I'll just say it in words, K times. Okay, great. So how are we going to prove this? Well, we're going to use an interesting proof by contradiction that uses like kind of the size, if you will, of these solutions. Okay, so let's say by way of contradiction, suppose that this is not true. So in other words, we have n comma a is a solution to star, but n comma a is not on the list. So in other words, n comma a is not equal to f sub k of v, and this is going to be for all k bigger than or equal to zero, and for all v from the set Let's see, 0 comma 1 and 1 comma 1. Great. So that would just be maybe a fancy way of saying that this solution is not on our list. Suppose that the n value that we have here, which I guess is bigger than or equal to 0, is the smallest. And I'll just put in quotes here like this. So in other words, it's the smallest solution to our equation that's not on the list. Okay, great. But now let's consider the following. And perhaps I'll call this n not a not, which is equal to f inverse applied to n comma a. So now we've got two truths about this. So we have n not is strictly less than n, and that's pretty clear because notice that n naught is simply equal to this um, f of f inverse of n is simply equal to this n minus 4a plus 2 which is less than n. Okay so n naught is less than n and n naught comma a naught is a solution. But n naught a naught is a solution. It's a smaller solution. But if it's a smaller solution, it must be on the list. So in other words, we have n naught a naught is equal to f sub, I'll maybe call it L, evaluated at v with v, one of these things that's either 0 comma 1 or 1 comma 1. Because again, it's a solution, it's smaller than the minimal solution off of the list, which means it has to be on the list. But essentially, this is the downfall of our contradictory argument. And that is to note the following, that we have n comma a is simply f of n naught comma a naught, which is gonna be equal to um, f sub l plus one of v meaning that n comma a is in fact on the list, but that's a contradiction. And so, well, what did we end up contradicting? Well, we ended up contradicting this assumption up here that said that it was possible to have a solution off of one of these lists, which means all such solutions are on this list. Now, if you guys are psyched about this result, I urge you to look at the rest of this paper. They, in fact, come up with a nice closed form of these solutions. That closed form is kind of in line with the spirit of the closed form of these square triangular numbers. And that's a good place to stop.